the act of reproducing is the demonstration. Why would it be any different? This is a rather trite demonstration. That's a very complex demonstration, but it's exactly the same thing. The reproducibility of the experiment is the demonstration. Right? The demonstration, the premise, leads to the conclusion that this is the right hand of a human. Right? Okay. Um, that is, what are the conditions factors that necessitate its truth? Right? So we recognize then that for more, the example of the performative example of this is my right hand here, this is my left hand here, is a demonstration in the premise for the conclusion, the adduced conclusion, that my example, my example, is a representation and a demonstration that what is what's the word that two human hands exist, right? As my as my conclusion that two human hands exist. That's what. I, that's where all of this was going. Okay. Um, Factors that necessitate its truth. Okay. So two two C. In the premise, Moore combines a certain gesture with an utterance of "here." Right. So this is a, a quote. So in the premise, Moore quote combines the combination of a certain gesture with an utterance of "here." Here is my right hand. Here is my left hand which he knows, right? It's not a matter of, as we said before, it's not a matter of belief, and it is also not something which is true, but he doesn't know to be true. It is true, and he knows it to be true. He says, quote, um, which he knows, quote, would be absurd to suggest that he did not know it, but only believed it, and that perhaps it was not the case. And there's an exclamation part uh, Mark in the original. I think this is funny because months and months ago on Facebook I said, are there any academic um, texts where they've used an exclamation mark? Uh, Mark? Absolutely there is. Um, G.E. Moore's, um, what's the name of this? Proof of the External World has an exclamation mark in it. So the answer is yes, academic texts, you are allowed to use exclamation marks which is uh, inside nerd joke, has absolutely nothing to do with the lecture series, but it, yes, you can use exc exclamation marks. Yes, it would be absurd. He's pissed, right? Moore's like, dude, if you're going to tell me that I don't know this, then the confusion isn't in me, it's in you, because you seem to be rather confused. Here is a demonstration, and guess what? You can demonstrate it too. I'll give you the formula of how you prove it. Just say, here is my right hand. Now you try it, and if you're like, well, this might be my right hand, He's thinking, cognitively speaking, there's something wrong with this person. <laughs> How could you not know that that was your right hand? Why would you question the authenticity of the knowledge that this is in fact your right hand? It is not a critique of the logic. It is not a critique of external reality. It is a critique of the construct of your own mind. And in a sense, without saying it, but I'll say it on behalf of more, there's something defective about your mind for you to not to <laughs> There's something defective about your mind for you not to believe that that is in fact your right hand. Are you serious? You're making me write this right now? It's absurd! Exclamation point. Shout out to Moore. Shout out to Moore, right? So he says, quote, It would be absurd to suggest that he, Moore, I think he says I in the original, that he did not know it, but only believed it, and that perhaps it was not the case. It's absurd, right? It's absurd. Okay. So, um, I want to read, I want to read, uh, I want to read uh, a section. Let me check my battery to make sure that I still have enough battery. Yeah. Okay. So we are at 2D. Um, read misprint example on page 25. Okay. So here's an example that Moore gives, and I think it's I think it's a rather genius. Uh, I think it's a rather genius example. So I'm going to give the example, or I'm going to read the example and then show why this example relates to, supports, serves as, though he said he didn't have to give any more example, he gives you another example just to demonstrate the reproducibility of, quote unquote, the, the experiment, right? This is undeniably logically consistent. So here is the example of the misprint. So this is, <coughs> this is page 25, first column on the left. About a, about, you know, a tenth of the way you down, a fifth of the way down starts to suppose. Okay. This is a misprint example. Suppose, for instance, it were a question whether there were as many as three misprints 
on a certain page in a certain book. There are three misprints on a certain page on a certain book. A says there are. B is inclined to doubt it. So A says, hey, there are three misprints on a certain page in a certain book, and B says, I doubt it. B is obviously the skeptic. How could A prove that he was right? How could A prove that there are, in fact, three misprints on a certain page in a certain book to satisfy the condition of denying B's doubt, which is to affirm the existence of these three misprints on a certain page on a certain book? Surely, he, being A, could prove it by taking the book, turning to the page, and pointing to the three separate places on it, saying, there is one misprint here, another here, and another here. Also, I mean, G.E. Moore just is a profoundly really good writer. Surely, that is a method by which it might be proved! Exclamation point. Surely that satisfies the condition of proof! Here's a misprint, here's a misprint, here's a misprint. You doubt that there are three misprints on this page? Okay, no problem. Here's a misprint, here's a misprint, and here's a misprint. And I, I came up with an example on the right here today, and I'm going to write my own example to demonstrate yet again, demonstrate yet again, um, the validity of the proof. Of course, A would not have proved by doing this that there were at least three misprints on the page in question unless it was certain that there was a misprint in each of the places to which he pointed. He would not, A, would not have been certain in his demonstration unless there were, in fact, three errors on the page. But to say that he might prove it in this way is to say that it might be certain that there was, in fact, these misprints, right? To say that, to say that it might be the case that his knowledge, A's knowledge of the misprints of the page are one of belief and not of knowledge, is to say that the misprints themselves, provided that there are misprints on the page, are this, the certainty of these misprints aren't known, which is absolutely ridiculous, and I'm going to give you an example to demonstrate this. Moore doesn't give us an example. I'm going to give you an undeniable, I'm going to give you an example which undeniably demonstrates, uh, demonstrates this. And if such a thing as this could ever be certain, then assuredly it was certain just now and there was one hand in one of the two places I indicated in the other. So he says that this argument is just like the, and my battery's going to die, so let me just super quick uh, plug this in. Sorry about that. Our dependency in technology. Okay, so, um, so Moore says, again, he gives the, the misprint example. Oh, my God, what time is it? Let me turn my volume off. I apologize, people. Getting text too damn early. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Moore says... So, we're going to talk about Moore's misprint example. And the misprint example is used as yet another demonstration of epistemological knowledge of proof. Right? He says... Um, that this example, the misprint example, sort of editorially speaking, serves as proof just like the example here is my right hand gesture, here is my left hand gesture. And we've been deconstructing the tremendous, the, the tremendous amount of logical consistency and rigor that informs Moore's argument, right? It's, it's in no sense a rather trite demonstration of proof. So I came up with, I came up with this example in, in homage, if you will, to Moore's, to Moore's description of the misprint, right? So, here's my sentence, and my sentence will have three um, misprints in it. What was it? Uh, yeah. And just to be like uh, more, we'll, we'll make it emphatic and put an exclamation point. I am not for sale. I am not for sale. <laughs> All right, the truth of that, the truth of that, um, and that being not what this, not what the sentence points to, but the truth of the linguistic relationship in terms of 
word selection. There are three errors in this, and they, it is undeniable. I am going to demonstrate that there are three errors in this, and if you understand the English language, you too should be able to find the three errors. This is exactly like the example that Moore gives. He's saying, listen, there are three errors in this sentence, and I'm going to prove it to you. A is going to prove it to B, the person who doubts it. You can be as skeptical because you want, but if you deny that my demonstration, when I underline it, when I wave my hand, that my demonstration satisfies the condition that I know there to be three errors, then there's then the burden of proof is in your court to demonstrate how I don't know because there are in fact three errors. And I can reproduce this virtually now, on behalf of more, to a global audience because all of you will be able to demonstrate it as well. So the first is I, obviously, this EYE is an eyeball, not I, right? So that's one. Not is two, because this is a, a knot that's tied in a rope, if, for example, or many other interpretations of not, but it's not N-O-T, right? This should be I, this should be N-O-T, and then sail is not S-A-I-L, right? That's like a boat, right? It's not purchase, right? So here are the three errors. One, two, three. I've just demonstrated, this is Moore's argument, I've just demonstrated that there are, in fact, three errors. So, to read Moore's argument again with this in the background now, suppose, for instance, it were a question whether there were as many as three misprints on a certain page in a certain book. A says there are. B is inclined to doubt. How could A prove that he is right? Surely he could prove it by taking the book, turning to the page, and pointing to three separate places on it, saying, there is one misprint here, another here, another here. Surely, that is a method by which it might be proved, of course. A could not have proved by doing this that there were at least three misprints on a page in question unless it was certain that there was a misprint in each of the places to which he pointed. It is absolutely certain that within the context of the sentence, this is incorrect. It is absolutely certain that within the context of the sentence, this is incorrect. It is absolutely certain that within the context of this sentence, this is correct. Incorrect, right? So, um, hopefully my example facilitates a greater understanding of what Moore is doing, and then obviously this pertains to the performative act of demonstrating absolute knowledge, epistemological knowing that this is in fact my right hand, that this is in fact my left hand. I know it to be the case because it is the case. <laughs> Which is not tautological now. We know that it's different, right? I know it to be the case because it is the case is sort of a rather trite, condensed way of saying it, but we now know that it's not a, that it's not tautological, and you should be able to identify why it's not tautological. It's not tautological. This is his first demonstration of the proof, because within the premise we have the performative act, which is not in the conclusion, right? And then number three, finally, quote, unless the conclusion really did follow from the premise, right? If your premise is true, your conclusion must be true, right? If your premise, now granted you can, your premise can be false, but if your premise is true, your conclusion has to be true, right? It is quite certain then, last bit, it is quite certain then that the conclusion did follow from the premise, that it is certain as it is that if there is one hand here and another hand and another here now, then it follows that there are two hands in existence now. Okay, so that concludes um, Moore's account and Moore's discussion into the proof of the external world. I hope you recognize then the arguably legitimacy, I believe in this, of the mine independent external reality that's the first part. I hope that you recognize that was sort of the product of this argument. I hope you also recognize that it is not a denial of Berkeley's subjective idealism as much as it is a demonstration of the lack of sufficiency in Berkeley's claim. It's that there's more to existence than perception and the proof is in the pudding, meaning that the proof 
to external reality isn't just the perception, but the demonstration. And that there's, there's also a very undeniable demonstrative act that is needed to satisfy not the existence of external reality, because it exists as such. To satisfy the epistemological awareness of external reality, you cannot do so without demonstration. This is the, the act of scientific reproducibility. This is a performative demonstration that this is my right hand and this is my left hand. With that, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell. Have a good day.